Thank you very much indeed. Um, as my name Gisela indicates, I'm not English uh, or British. Uh, Gisela was Charlemagne's sister's name. And I come from a part of the world when I first described it to a journalist. He said, ah, I know exactly what, what it's like. Socialists and Protestants, there were so few, we knew them by name. Uh, it's about the place where the last pope came from. And therefore, I always find myself in one of those moments where I feel distinctly foreign in English Catholic circles. Uh, because if you come from the majority religion of being a Catholic, uh, your Catholicism is ethnic rather than religious. Uh, and I have to confess, it wasn't until Pope Benedict came to this country that it truly dawned on me why people refer to Catholics or Roman Catholics. Uh, and the, the most amazing thing is when you get sworn in as a privy councillor, the Catholics still have a different oath. It's slightly different words. And the hierarchy of swearing in is Protestants, Muslims, Jews, Catholics. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I kind of sort of slightly familiar why the, the, the Catholic Church here has got a, occasionally still feels a little bit beleaguered. But uh, just like Tim, uh, I just want to urge you to be very, very careful about make, drawing analogies between the European Union and Catholicism. Uh, John, who I love dearly, and we first met in Afghanistan somewhere, whilst he was being shot at, and I just went in as a political tourist. Uh, uh, referred to the European Constitution. Um, if Christianity, the argument of a Christianity in the Constitution had nothing to do with the French. Or was it, was it Tim? Had, uh, was you? Had, actually, had, had nothing to do with the question about the French attitude towards it. It had that Giscard d'Estaing wanted the Constitution on page one to say the European Union is a Christian institution. In other words, he wanted to say Turkey need not apply. The challenge which the European Union now faces is, has one to do with values, but not the kind which you think about. Because let, let's just, and again, read my speech in the Catholic voice or whatever, I should completely abandon this now. Because I, I, I think we, we need to get a bit of historic reality here. An institution that started in 1957 to become formalized with the, the noblest of motives, and I think has been enormously successful. It has stopped Germany and France ever going to war again. Uh, it created a union that up to a certain level was enormously successful. In 1973, when the United Kingdom joined, arguably that was the moment when every other country in Europe was deprived of the choice whether it wished to relate to its neighbors merely in trading terms or by deeper political integration. Because the founding fathers knew one thing, is that if you had free movement of people, and this is why the free movement of people question is so central to this debate, if you don't just exchange goods, but also have people moving, then the possibility, as they saw it, of war would simply not happen because you'd have a, a civil integration and part of that required such things as a creation of a single currency. It would requ it require something of a creation of a, a country called Europe, a United States of Europe. Now, I grew up in a federal state. I am utterly agnostic as to what structure you want, but it requires certain things. Uh, and I want to draw an analogy between good union and bad union. A good union actually is the United Kingdom union. It's one that created a supranational identity. It abandoned identification by bloodline hundreds of years before mainland Europe did. I can with ease say I'm British. I could never say I'm English because I'm not. I'm a Bavarian farmer's daughter. Thank you very much. But I am British because it's a supranational concept which requires certain things you do to identify yourself. And the United Kingdom Union, probably best shown in the referendum over Scotland, is one that realized that for political structures to work, they require democratic legitimacy, they require consent, they now require responsiveness to its people. And the current trend within the United Kingdom is greater devolution of power, and the United Kingdom Union has done that. Compare that with bad union. Bad union is the European Union, which grew beyond its original boundaries and simply never ever accepted that it also required to adapt to that need. What was fine for the original six, nine, and probably it could have just about done it for the 12, was 28 and growing 
simply will not work. And the reason why it will not work is because it does not have a demos. It does not have a unity which will mean people will make sacrifices on behalf of each other because they know, they say, this is we. And that's why this notion that the, the Euro and the European Union are not the same actually is slightly flawed. Because my main reason for why I'm saying we should, should leave is that the core countries of the European Union, the Eurozone, requires that deeper political integration. It does have to become a federal state of Europe. It does have to start to address the problem that you've got 50% of young people unemployed increase, 42% you know, in Spain. Uh, it has to address that the post-war peace settlement was one where economic stability was supposed to be provided by the common market and military stability was supposed to be provided by the backdrop of NATO. And what you've now got is an institution that thinks fortress Europe will save us from the waves of globalization. And we've had three waves. One was goods and services, and in a sense that's why the World Trade Organization has become much more important than, the, than, than, than this block of the European Union that comes in between. The second one was financial flows. 2008 taught us one thing, is that the European Union was singularly, and, and actually most of our post-war institutions were singularly incapable of dealing with it. And what we've now got, the third wave, which is people. And what are we doing? We are outsourcing the borders of the European Union to Turkey. That is what we've done. We, ha we, have, we have said we, we have a process of application of becoming a member of the European family, which requires you to comply with certain values, the abolition of, of, of the death penalty, certain basic human rights. But when it suits us, we will give Turkey enormous amounts of money, 1.9 billion. We will accelerate their, their accession. We will give them free visas because they're helping us out of a temporary problem. The long-term solution is that for the Eurozone to, has to be successful, it needs to integrate. And I think it needs for the United Kingdom and other countries to re-establish the fact that if you are in Europe, there are different ways in which you can relate to your neighbors. One is from nation state to nation state, and the other one is you create a larger nation state. And if we don't do this, we will come to the point where the crisis point will be an unmanaged one. And that leads me to uh, some, something which I think is really important. It is absolutely right when people criticize the nature of the debate. The problem is that facts about the future are very hard to come by. So, I have a real problem with the Prime Minister's choice to have this referendum now. As a matter of fact, it made me enormously angry that he had it now. We should have had a referendum on Maastricht because you, the voter, would have been asked, do you want this or do you want this? We should have had a referendum on the Lisbon Treaty because you, the voter, would have been asked, do you want this or this? It is an abuse of democratic processes to run a national referendum on the basis, this is what I tell you is good, and the rest of you can just make it up as you go along what you think the alternative is. So let me tell you what the alternative is. You actually can take control over your borders. And when people say we have control over borders, no, we don't. We have control over some asking people for a piece of paper. I'm a Birmingham MP, an enormous ethnic diversity. I find it very difficult to explain an immigration policy which is discriminatory against non-Europeans. It is hard to explain. And I think you as a voter, you've got a right to ask me, the politician, to justify my political decisions. I want to take control about some of our taxation decision making. And I think democracy thrives when three things happen. That the processes of decision making are transparent. In the European Union, they are not. The, the most wonderful trick of the European Union is you make a decision now, you then don't implement it for at least 10 years. So anybody who's ever made the decision is a bit like the Schleswig-Holstein question, gone mad, dead, or has forgotten what it was. Uh, and you're just faced with it that it just happens, and then you can't reverse it. The second one is, I think it should be accountable to you. You should be able to re remove those who make the decisions on your behalf. And the third is, they should have your consent. None of these things happen. And by the way, on the 24th of June, even if we leave, we are all still European. The modern day Turners will still travel to Italy, and the modern day Holbeins and Haydens will still come to London. It is not fog in the channel, we are cut off. 
And we will still be good internationalists because we will still be part of NATO, we will still be part of the UN, we will still be part of the international organizations. But the European Union I'm talking about is a political project of deeper integration which has failed to acquire the consent of the people. And for that reason, I say we're better off at. Thank you.